we have one destiny, and that is the kingdom of heaven. And I believe you, as I am, am eagerly waiting for the coming of Jesus. We're eagerly waiting for that call because the world is darkening. It's actually much, much darker than it used to be when Christ came. He came into the darkness, so the darkness didn't receive him. Now there's not even a glimmer of light in the world anymore, in any country. There's confusion, there's, there's horror happening. And um, yesterday I received a, a, a text message and a, and a photograph saying 77 nations. The 77 nations are serving Satan at the Commonwealth Games, bowing the knee to a 10 meter high bull which have brought into the arena and Satanists are in the arena worshipping this bull in front of all the spectators openly. And that's where we are in the world at the moment. Satanism is now no more subjective, it's no more underground, it is open and proudly displayed, displayed before the world. The nations are lapping it up because they have no other direction. They refuse to accept the Lord as their saviour because they are guilt-ridden and uh, um, uh, uh, attack is the best form of defence. And so when you try and speak to somebody who is guilty, they will turn around and attack you instead to try and divert your accusations or your gift of hope or your direction to say you should try and do this uh, and you get reviled and rejected. So the world is in a sad and a sorry state. Satanism is on its rise. Occultism is on the rise. Um, the nations are under the rule of the ruler of this age, Satan. That's where the nations are. That's where the governments are. That's why in the last couple of years we've been having the same message through the whole world. The Great Reset. Build back better. Put your masks on. Every single government speaking and saying and doing the same thing. But we have Christ who is our light. We have him who has bound us together. We have him who is calling us and directing us and enabling us to have a hope that no one else has had and has got unless they turn to Jesus. And so praise the Lord that we are able to worship him because he has given us of his spirit and his Holy Spirit is drawing us and guiding us and building us up. And so I think that we can all confidently say the theme of our story is I believe. And because I believe, I belong. And we have full confidence. We're told in the book of 1 John that we have confidence and access to the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we have that confidence and that access, we know that we have been received. We know that we have been put into the same position as Christ was because we are part and parcel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the hardships come upon us, we must not be surprised because Jesus was crucified. Jesus faced the hardships, but he set his face as flint towards Jerusalem. We, we worship a God that we haven't seen. We have never seen him. No man has seen God, but we must worship him. That's a bit of a conundrum in a sense, isn't it? If, imagine what would it be like if we did not have the word of God. What would we be doing? Well, we would be worshiping, worshiping something. We would be worshiping the sun or the moon or the stars. We would be looking because of the way that we are made and the desire to, to recognize something bigger and better than myself. We would find something to set our hearts upon, our energies upon, and our goals upon to achieve something, which is what the world is basically doing at the moment. We would be no different from them. But we've been given the word to worship by it and by the parameters given in it to us, the unseen God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all creation, who, through the Lord Jesus Christ, has had what we see and know as the world made. So we worship the Lord and the living God. And with that worshipping, we find that 95%, and I'm just using that as a general figure, 95% of population have missed the bus. They're worshipping something besides Jesus, and they are worshipping another God. And even with the little 5% that is left, sometimes they are preaching another Jesus, 
as Paul says in the book of Colossians. Another Jesus, a Jesus who is, have you ever, have you ever smelt a, a bottle of milk or tasted or, or, or poured it into your cup of coffee and, and you see something slightly off or you smell a little bit of an odor? It's still milk. It's still milk, but it's going sour. And you find that you need to discard it. And except, of course, if you're in Africa, you turn it into what you call, I suppose in England it would be called curds and whey. If you can get milk to do that anymore, fresh milk, we would call it moss. But it's still milk. And the word of God is preached. Jesus is preached. But it is another Jesus. And there's a slight twist to the tail. And as time goes on, you can actually work out, I better get away from here because this is dodgy. And so we have a specifically difficult road through a very small aperture, a gate, to go through and to walk. Tests and trials come along that way. And there's lots of diversions and deviations along that way. But we have to determine how we are going to get to the goal. And the only way that we can get there is through the word of God, as we have it. No adding to it, no subtracting to it, no dicking it up and making it better and more wonderful and more great and more attractive. The word of God is brutal and it tells things exactly as it is. The word of God is so true that one of the greatest men here in the word of God recognized by God Almighty is a murderer. And yet because of our heart that was after God, he is going to be on one of the thrones ruling in eternity. His name is David, King David. We know what happened to David. We know where he came from and we know what happened to him. And we know why he got into all the trouble that he had. But that's where the flesh is in our lives. The flesh is an enemy constantly walking alongside me, trying to topple me from my status that I have in the living God, always accusing me, always trying to say, this is an easier way, this is a better way, you don't need to do that, you don't need to do that, but why don't you just try that? But God's way is vital. I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 66, and I'm going to read from verses 1 to 5, leaving out the second part of verse 2. So, I'll get back to that later, so don't uh, interrupt and say, hang on, you, you missed out a couple of lines. That's on purpose. And so Isaiah chapter 66. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. Verse 3. He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. Just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy but they shall be ashamed. And so, having read this, I've contemplated a little bit about it, and hence my question, how do we serve a living God who is unseen, who has not been seen by any man, who's made the heavens and the earth? Heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? How are we going to worship him? With what are we going to worship him? He has a complaint. He said, all these things I've made. So what are you going to give me? When we read of the history of the kings and everything that happens in the Old Testament, we, re we read how they used to bring gifts to one another. Gifts of silver and gold, of servants and slaves, and all sorts of manners of spices and all sorts of herbs and things. Gifts for the kings. Gifts fit for the king. But what are we going to bring to the Lord? What can we give him? He goes on to say here in verses three, in verse three, speaking about the bull, 
He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. You'll remember that that was his law. That is what he said to his chosen people, the Israelites. Blood has to be shed to give sanctification and forgiveness for your sins. Blood has to be shed. And if you sin in such a way, we'll kill a bull. And if you sin in such a way, you'll kill a lamb. And if you sin in such a way, we need a goat. And if you sin another way, we need a dove. But one way or another, blood will be shed. That, that is done. That is what the law says. And that is what his chosen people had to do. When Solomon became king, he slaughtered 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep within a matter of 14 days. That equates to something like 300 bulls a day and seven or 8,000 sheep a day. Can you imagine the carnage, the blood, the stench, the stink, the efforts? The Levites weren't, weren't preachers or priests or anything else. They were butchers. They were slaughtering until the blood was just running. And this is to please the unseen God. According to his law, Isaiah here tells us what he says to these people who were doing that. God says, he says, he who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. In other words, you murderers. That's what he's saying. Because if I, if I, am, if I kill something and it's almost like I've killed a man, I, I'm equated as a murderer because I've done an evil and a vile deed. But what happened when Jesus came? What happened? He brought an end to the sacrifices. He brought an end to the offerings. And yet they persisted in killing bulls. And they persisted in doing the sacrifices for another 70 odd years, if I'm not mistaken. I cannot remember exactly. Until the temple was once again desecrated. Because the temple, it's the temple which is the idol. Everyone fled to the temple. Everyone went to the temple because that is where God is. And what happened when Jesus went to the temple? He took a whip of cords and he drove everyone out and he accused them of, being a den, of it being a den of robbers. That is what happened when men try and worship with their hands this unseen God that we serve. And they do things in a manner which arouses his wrath and his anger. And then he brings enemies upon the men. And that's what happened to Jerusalem. It was raised to the ground. The temple was raised to the ground. Every single stone, as Jesus had prophesied, was broken down and there was nothing left. And all because of what man was doing. He who sacrifices a lamb is as if he breaks a dog's neck. A dog is one of the worst animals in the Jewish eyes. A dog was really unacceptable. And that is now the lamb. Jesus was the lamb that was slain. He is the picture of of gentleness and kindness and humbleness and long-suffering and patience. A lamb never bleats. A lamb, well, it does bleat, but it didn't cry out. A lamb is always patient. Have you ever shorn a sheep? You've grabbed the sheep, it says not a word, and you can hold it in any way to shear it, and even when you miss and you pinch it with the, with the shears and you, and, you, and you cut a V in its skin, it doesn't say a word, but the blood runs. Jesus was crucified. He was the lamb. Here it says, he who kills sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood, something so unacceptable. These are the offerings that God ordained in the Old Testament. Isaiah is now accusing these people of saying, this is what God says of you because you are doing these things. And they were doing that for financial gain, but they were doing that also because they wanted to please the Lord one way or another. The masses of the population were following them and they were blindly doing the things that they were told to do because the law said so. Jesus came to fulfill the law and in every single way he fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. Nothing was left undone. And because of that, God received him into the kingdom of heaven. The grave is empty. No more is he in the tomb. He is at the right hand of the Lord. And we worship him as the living God.
And because he left, he sent his Holy Spirit upon us that we tonight even can be gathered here with a united heart to say we want to worship this unseen God in more ways. And, and we need each other to inspire one another, to exhort one another, and to challenge one another and say, come brothers, walk and do this thing. We need to do it because there's a goal waiting for us in heaven. And we are all going to stand before the Lord one day to give an answer for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Judgment day is coming for the believer and the unbeliever. But praise the Lord, we have already faced a judgment when we were, when we were uh, um, a challenge to say, do you know Jesus Christ? He is the Savior. He is the only way. And by the grace of the Lord, we saw the road and we said, yes, please. And we received of his spirit. We became born again. And now we have new hearts. We have a new understanding. We have a new mind. And we can walk with Christ as he speaks through his word to us. We have no other revelation. Yes, true, we have the general revelation of the sun and the moon and the stars and of creation and of of all the animals and the insects and how the, how the seasons come and go and winter comes and then summer comes and, and its cycle carries on consistently, constantly keeping its time. The sun and the moon and the stars keep their distance, keep their space. The seas run as they're supposed to run. Everything works like clock, clockwork. That's the general revelation. But the specific revelation is a personal revelation it is to me and to you and to you and to you as individual people, the revelation day by day, as we are prepared to accept and receive what God says to us through the word, as difficult as it might be sometimes, if you overcome a difficult project, the next time you have the same project, it's a piece of cake. You've done it before. And you get a diff more difficult one. And so the hill gets steeper and steeper. The challenges become more and more difficult. But you need to exercise yourselves towards godliness to be able to achieve what God has prepared for us to do to meet that criteria, to get the diploma, to get the, the certificate, can I say, of acceptance. Though we have been accepted, I'm not saying that we have not. We have been accepted, but we have a job to do. And the job doesn't stop when we die today. We have a job in heaven which God is preparing, for we are going to rule and reign with him. So he is preparing us to do that work. We needn't be afraid of men's hearts, of men's faces, and when people look at us and say, how can you say a thing like that? You can say, because the Bible says so. It's not me. I am the messenger. We are the messenger. God is given us his word. For every word we are told comes from the mouth of God and is profitable for the man of God. And so... These people were doing what they thought was right. I say what they thought was right. The common people were doing what they thought was right. But the priests knew what they were up to. And they were cashing in on this. And they became wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. So that when Jesus came and went into the temple, the temple, a holy place, was filled with stalls, a marketplace. And Ananias was the guy who was almost keeping the purse. And he was raking in because everyone needed to buy stock, whether it be sheep, cattle, bulls, goats, lambs, pigeons. Ananias has got it. Ananias has got it. The priests have got it. And so they, they were raking in. And, 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 and the time of Jerusalem, I've read somewhere when Jerusalem was was filled with the, with the people who came to worship. There were something like two, over two million people in Jerusalem. Can you imagine the marketing that was going on and the exchange of money and how these wealthy men were rolling in money because of what they were doing? And Jesus chased them out of the temple because they, they, were, they were dwelling upon the poor people of the, of the country and they were ripping them off and they were denuding them of the money that they had. And so he goes on in verse 4 and he says, I'm going to choose their delusions and bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, no one answered. And when I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. So these abominations and delusions that we have, if you read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11, you'll find there that God is going to bring strong delusions upon the people in our time. 
So then all these people that I spoke about prior to the meeting who were worshipping the bull that they see at the Commonwealth Games, they are going to follow the strong delusion because they don't love the truth of the word. And that is the bottom line. Remember when Jesus was standing before Pilate, Jesus said to him, I am the truth. And Pilate said, what's truth? What's truth? Not interested in truth. That's what people are saying now. Isaiah says somewhere in, 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 in his book, I can't remember exactly where it was, truth has fallen in the street. Now, today, truth has fallen in the street. Though this was written so long, so long ago, today there is no truth. You speak truth to people and they say, rubbish, rubbish. We'll do it our way. And so because they don't want the truth, they want the lie, God is going to give them the lie. He's going to give them that strong delusion. And they are going to follow it because they think it's the right way. The mark of the beast, it's on its way. We've had COVID. And what happened in COVID? Have you been vaccinated? No. Sorry, you're not allowed in our shop. And the guards would turn you away. That has already happened. And that is a precursor to what is going to come. Even today, people are still wearing masks because of COVID. Though it's been proven time and time again that masks are ineffective, they do not work. In actual fact, they make life more misery and, and, and worse. But this is all a precursor to the mark of the beast, which is coming. Everything that is happening is coming so quickly and so violently fast that we, I believe, in a very, very short while are going to see our lives change yet once again to a greater degree. Even as I speak, the World Economic Forum are trying to take our cars away because there are too many cars. And if they take your cars away, then you are going to be more controlled, more manipulated because we don't have the ability to go and do what we want to do. They tried to close down all the small businesses. That failed. And Klaus Schwab, who is the leader of the World Economic Forum, in one of his letters, he says, we have, such a, we have such a small window of opportunity. We must make the most of the opportunity that we have, while the time is right, that we can get this thing going. Well, they failed. And now what's happening? There's a famine coming. There's a famine which has been... Uh, uh, pushed by the world governments with all these strange occurrences with, with uh, food processing plants, which one after the other have suddenly had strange fires happening in them. We have famines coming because of the droughts in the countries. We have famines coming because of the extensive floods, for instance, in China. We have famine coming because of the war in U Ukraine, which supplies one-fifth of the world's necessary commodities. Famine is coming. Things are changing. Life is going to get harder and more difficult even in our lifetime. But God is going to send these people a strange delu delusion because of what they have done. We have been exempted from this because he says in, 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 in Psalms, in various places, um, in Psalm 33 and in Psalm 37, that he is going to look after us in a famine because I have mentioned famines I need to comfort. So with something to do with famines, God is going to look after us, even as he did the Israelites looking after the, the, the Jews when uh, they had the famine in Joseph's time. God said he will look after us. And so we need to have confidence and comfort in the word of God that he is going to supply our needs according to his riches and glory. But so now I've tried to paint a miserable picture about what happens when you worship God according to the letter of the law. You need to slaughter a bull. You need to slaughter a dove. You need to slaughter a lamb. All these sort of things. And God said, I hate it. He says that to us in the book of Malachi. I hate your, your sacrifices. But he, he did um, indicate that that was not what he wanted to do. And even to the point that he said to them in one place that they are robbing him. No, I, I cannot find it where he said he hates the sacrifices. But God does hate these sacrifices because of the bloodshed, because of the, everything that pertained and it went with the whole thing. So God does not and is not happy with these sacrifices. With what then is he happy? He has to be happy about something. And he tells us what he is happy about in 
chapter 66 of Isaiah, verse 2, the second one, the second part of it. But on this one will I look, he says, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. And so he has exchanged that physical sacrificial work that has been going on with rivers of blood flowing. And he's now pointed his scepter at our hearts. And he said, that is what I need. I need your heart. I need your attention. I need you in a specifically narrow way of humbleness. Because we are a proud people. God hates pride. But he wants us to humble us. What does a man require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Those are three requisites that we are told in the book of Malachi, uh, sorry, in the book of Micah, that he desires and that he wants. And so he's expecting of us now these qualities of a contrast spirit and a one who trembles at his word. What is a contrast spirit? A contrast spirit is being ashamed. It is being conscious stricken. It is being guilt ridden. It is being unworthy. It is being regretful. It is being sorry. That's what happens when you're contrite. If you're caught out, if you've done something wrong, if you find that you haven't met the mark, then you feel contrite about it. And that is what we ought to be when we are approaching the Lord, when we realize our own sinful natures which still cling to us, though we worship God in the Spirit. He gives us his Holy Spirit to empower us, to enable us to be able to worship in spirit and truth by his word recognizing that we have nothing in and of ourselves to be able to please God. It doesn't matter what status I have, what achievements I've received, my abilities, but what he wants us to do is worship him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and we need to worship him in the manner in which he is wanting us to do it. This invisible God that no one has seen wants us to worship him with that that we do not see, it is our heart. It is our spirit. It is our soul. And our body and our soul and our spirit are united in one body, inseparable. But what is inside of my heart comes out of my mouth. And what comes out of my mouth, people hear and they judge and they look at you and you conform yourself to the words that you've said that you may not be found a liar, but that you may be true in what you're professing that God is great. And if God is great and I am a son of God, I need to walk like God says I need to walk. And woe that man who is not walking in a manner that God is expecting and wanting of him. When we walk and when we talk, people in the world look at us. And many times I've heard it say, I'm not a Christian because I don't want to be like that man. I don't want to be like that man. And so many times the word of God is blasphemed because of the actions and the ways of believers, so-called believers, who are professing the word of God, but they are, as I said in the beginning, preaching another Jesus. And Jesus himself spoke about that humbleness which is necessary in Matthew chapter 5. And he said there in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus spelt it out every single step of the way that that is what is going to be wonderfully received in God's eyes. How opposite is that not to our own conduct, to the own way that we conduct ourselves in, in the world? When somebody attacks me, I want to attack him back. I don't want to turn the other cheek and say, well, I'm sorry, you know, I made a mistake. Because, because of my character, because of my nature, and that is the problem that I have. I have this fleshly man always standing alongside of me wanting to get up and fight and do things. And, 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 and humbleness is hard. To be meek is difficult. To be joyful is even more difficult. 
I'd like to sit at home and do nothing, but well, not nothing, but read the Bible and, and, and just to, to be quiet. It's so hard to be upbeat and to be able to be uh, joyful all the time and you know, have the joy of Christ in me all the time. That's what is expected of us. But he says, be meek, be humble, be patient, be long-suffering, be kind, be gentle. We have to exercise ourselves towards these things. And if we do that exercising, it does work. But then you forget it. It's much like an exercise in the gym. You go to a gym for a while, you get nice and fit, and then you get tired of going to the gym. So you don't go to the gym anymore. And then you get slothful and you get weak again. When you go back, you've got to start again from the bottom. But if we continually exercise ourselves in the Word of God, we, are, we will be able to be fit to be able to conduct ourselves in the manner that God wants us to do. In Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15, he tells us there that he will dwell in a high and a lofty place with him who has a contrite heart. 57 and verse 15. For thus is the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I will dwell in the high and the holy place with him who has a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God is so gracious. God, the creator of the heavens and earth, could have sent a king who came on a white horse with thousands of angels following him and said, I've come to take over. That's what he could have done. But he didn't. He chose the way which is foolish to the wisdom of men. And he sent his son, who is the king, but he sent him on a donkey. He sent him into this world to be the son of a carpenter and a carpenter's wife, to earn his living with his hands, as we all do. We earn our living with our hands. And then he sent him from there into the world. Not with any great noises, but he just came walking, simply clothed, and started talking. And everyone flocked to go and hear him preaching. From Jerusalem, they went out to the Jordan where Jesus was, where John was baptizing, to try and listen and look and see and hear who this Jesus was. And in no time at all, Jesus was turning the world upside down. Not by, anything, not by anything wonderful in himself, but by his actions, by his demeanor, and by what God was doing through him. And he then became a target for the leaders of the world. But he never changed his character. He was always meek. He was always humble. And if we have that same character in our hearts, and we are meek, and we are humble, and we want to walk with the Lord, the walk is with the word, the, the Lord is faithful and just to hear our words and to walk with us and to enable us and to encourage us. Psalm 34 and verse 18, the Lord said, uh, says there that the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Remember there were two men in, in, in Jerusalem. One was a Pharisee who went before the wall and he said, Oh, Lord, I'm so glad I've got what I've got. I'm glad I'm not like that man, that sinner down there who's praying like that. And the sinner down there was saying, Oh, Father, have mercy on me, for I am a sinful man. And he said that man went away justified more than the Pharisee who is praying out of his righteousness. We cannot please God on our terms. We have to please God on his terms. And his terms are written in the... In the book of life, the Bible that we have, the Lamb's book of life. The book of life, that I say, is not the book of life in the Lamb's book of life as we know it in the kingdom of heaven. But in this is life eternal for us. And that life is bound up in the obedience God is commanding of us in his word. Follow my word. Forget about the sacrificing. Forget about the lambs and the bulls and the goats and the calves and everything else. Be meek. Be humble, be just, and I will work with you. I will empower you. I will do the work for you. Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 11, he said, if you come, take 
Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We make a difficult job out of an easy task because we do not want to do it God's way. We do not want to do it his way. We try and do it our way. And when we try and do it our way, we make a mess of it in our own lives and we dissatisfy God. And he says, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Go sort yourself out, then come back to me when you've sorted out your own mess and your own problems instead of coming to him, believing that he is going to do the work that he wants to do in my life the way that he has planned. Because he says here, where is the house that you will build me and where is the place of my rest? God asked that question. His rest is inside of me. The house that he's going to build is inside of me. My temple is the temple of the living God, we're told in the book of Corinthians. And that is where God wants to rest. And he then will do the work. He will do the work. And if we pray continually, as Paul exhorts us to pray continually, to read the word continually, God will have free reign because we then, our characters, our natures, our demeanors, our morals, everything will be synchronized into the character that God wants to build us. Spurgeon was once asked, um, what's more important, praying or reading the Bible? And he said to the question, I said, read it, decide for yourself, he says. What's more important, breathing in or breathing out? And that's what I'm going to leave with you today. What do we need to do to please our invisible God who has revealed himself through his son, through the word of God that we have, which is the entire revelation that we have of the living God? All these people that were doing these things that we read about here in Isaiah chapter 66 about killing bulls and sacrificing lambs and offering uh, grain offerings, forget it. Follow the word of God. Because every single law, as I said earlier, has been fulfilled by Jesus. And now God does not speak through the law, which is a killer, because the letter of the law brings death, it kills. He speaks through the Spirit, and through the Spirit speaking to us through the Word of God. And now he says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. That is the culmination of God, his son whom he sent to die on the cross for us, who was the express image of God and was revealing God the Father through his actions, through his ways, through his character, through his nature, through his love. So let us try and have that same attitude that Jesus had and worship God in that freedom and that peace and that ease and that hopefulness that one day we will be able to rest in our souls in the kingdom of heaven because we will be with him and we will see him as he is. Amen.